Great. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, this presentation is going to focus on Autodesk Vault for non-CAD users. Uh, so what we're going to be talking about, I'm going to start with uh, an overview of uh, what Vault does. Um, I'm guessing that everyone here today uh, at least has some idea of what Vault does, um, but I'm going to briefly you know, discuss uh, specifically what Vault Workgroup and Vault Professional can do. Um, just because Vault Basic really isn't suited for non-CAD users. Um, then we'll move into uh, read-only access via the Vault Thin clients and also uh, a particular third-party application developed by Hagerman uh, called QVP Connection. Um, we'll move on from there for to discuss maybe non-CAD users that need to modify Vault data. Um, and then a little bit at the end, uh, talking about um, maybe non-traditional uses for Vault Pro's item functionality. It's um, something I've investigated here and there over the years, and um, there are some interesting potential applications for it. Um, so I, I thought I would just end up the presentation with some possibilities and you know a brief discussion in, in general of what items do um, and how they might be applied beyond just you know bills of material. So a brief review of what Vault Workgroup and Vault Professional uh, can do, right? So Vault Basic is not on this slide, but um, you know Vault Basic is just very basic check-in, check-out, version history, um, searching, uh, limited copy design, rename some tools that are useful for Inventor or AutoCAD files with XREFs. Um, but Vault Basic is designed really just for work in progress and only for CAD users. So we're not gonna really talk much about what Vault Basic does today, um, but just to make sure everyone understands the difference, say, between Vault Workgroup and Vault Professional, um, Vault Workgroup, you know, it does the check-in and check-out. It has the idea of revision control, so a system-controlled revision level. Um, it provides file and folder level security, so you can control view or edit access to individual files or folders. Uh, the revision control functionality that involves life cycles, um, you know, can control access to a file. Say a work in progress file may not be visible to certain people um, or a file may be locked when it's uh, in a released state. Um, Workgroup also includes uh, something called the job processor, which if you've not heard of that, um, is a way for some computer in your environment to say uh, update property information or create DWF or PDF documents based on uh, say file lifecycle state changes, for example. Um, and it also includes something called the data standard, the vault data standard, which again, people may not be terribly familiar with. Um, it's technically an add-on for vaults um, that started as something you would you know, download from the subscription center or your, in your Autodesk account. And now I believe it's an option that can be installed along with the client directly, I believe. Um, either way, it's easy to get. Um, and it does some things we'll get into later, like uh, help ensure data integrity, um, I think enables some additional workflows, um, adds the ability to customize Vault a little bit, um, so it can do some interesting things. Um, now, Vault Professional does everything Vault Workgroup does, right? And it adds on some key bits of functionality, uh, engineering change orders, um, bill of materials management, um, the idea being, you know, extract a bomb from Inventor, AutoCAD Electrical, AutoCAD Mechanical, um, and then manipulate that bomb a little bit to push it downstream, right, without using Excel or um, the ERP system to do that. Um, it also includes something called the Thin Client, which is going to be a, a major focus of today's presentation. Um, it's, I would say, the most common way that non-CAD users access Vault data today. Um, it also, on the back end of things, aside from functionality, it includes the ability to do incremental backups and live backups of the system while people are using Vault. Um, and it introduces the idea of replication as well, replicating data um, to different sites, either files or even database data. So with that in mind, um, let's move into um, probably the most common 
need for non-CAD users when interacting with Vault, um, which is read-only access. You know, um, CAD users need or non-CAD users need to get into Vault and look at something, right? Um, but Vault locks up your data, right? So how do you get people, especially if you're if you're moving to Vault um, from not having Vault at all? How do you get users who might be used to directly accessing the data you're going to store in Vault? How do you get them access to that, right? Well, the Vault Thin client um, is uh, one possibility and probably the most common tool that I see in use uh, with Vault current Vault users. Um, you could also purchase a license if you're using Vault Worker, but Vault Professional, you could purchase a license. Uh, for those non-CAD users, um, Vault Office, which we'll be talking about in a little bit, is uh, another type of license that works with Pro or Workgroup. It's a little less expensive, and it's designed specifically for non-CAD users to interact with Vault. So that's another way you could get access to the Vault data for non-CAD users. Um, or you could use a third-party product, something like Hagerman's QVP Connection, um, which could grant access to the data completely outside of the, the Autodesk universe, but still interacting with the Vault data itself, right? Um, but what about Vault Basic, um, right? Because if you own the product design and manufacturing collection, for example, you own Vault Basic, so why not that? Well, um, Vault Basic can only be installed on computers that have a CAD program installed. That's essentially how the software is quote unquote licensed. Um, you know, it's it's not, you don't have a separate license for Vault Basic, but it sort of piggybacks on your CAD license. So if you do not have the full version of AutoCAD or the full version of Inventor or some other qualifying CAD applications installed, um, you, you can't install Vault Basic, meaning you can't get into the vaulted data. Um, that includes, by the way, the viewers, right? So you can't say install uh, true view or inventor view and then install vault basic and get files and start looking at them that doesn't work right so vault basic is not suited for environments where you may have a large number of people that directly access uh, CAD data that need to right because there's just um, you know you would have to have some other solution for that and Anytime you put CAD data or really any data outside of your vault, if the vault is the control, now you're looking at uncontrolled copies. And that gets into lots of issues, both, you know, real issues from the standpoint of potentially looking at out of date information, but also if you're shooting for some sort of, you know, control certification, um, you know, like an ISO certification, for example, that's probably not going to go over well <laughs> with an auditor, right? Yeah, like, our controlled copies here in this vault, but everyone uses this uncontrolled thing sitting in a folder on the network, um, right? So Vault Basic, if you've got a lot of non-CAD users in an environment that need to interact with Vault data, Vault Basic's just really realistically not going to work, um, unless you use something like QVP connection from Hagerman that can serve as a substitute, right? Because it's giving you a sort of a a portal into that vault. Um, that you otherwise wouldn't be able to get with just the Autodesk software. Um, so, the as I said before, the primary means of users interacting with Vault, uh, non-CAD users, I should say, is through something called the Vault Thin Client, right? Now, this is a way you can access the, the Vault data via a web browser. Now, it's important to note this is not designed to be you know, give access to people outside your company, right? The thin client is really designed still to be used inside the firewall, but um, without the need to install a, a thick client on the user's computer. They can call up any browser, log into the vault as long as they've got an account to log in with. Um, you'll note it does work with Windows authentication if you're using Vault Professional. And it allows access to file data and uh, item and bill of material data. Um, it's important to note the thin client does not provide the ability to interact with the engineering change orders that are in Vault Professional. Um, for that, you would need a thick client, either Vault Office or Vault Pro. Um, now, the thin client is distributed with Vault Professional, 
and with Vault Professional, um, it does not require a license of any sort to interact with the Vault through the Thin Client. However, you'll notice if you've ever looked at the login screen or if you look on this page, there's a little checkbox here for read-only access. Um, now, if you have a license of Vault Office, which again is a, 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 a client license you can purchase, um, it, it's always sold in a multi-user format, means it's always a, a floating type license, but that does open up the ability to modify Vault data through a web browser, right? But only non-CAD data, only like PDFs or spreadsheets or documents, right? Not drawings or model files. Um, but what's interesting about Vault Office as well is you can get access to the Vault through a web browser, even with Vault Workgroup. Um, but to be very clear on this, um, if you buy a license of Vault Office and you own Vault Workgroup, you could have the Thin Client, but the only way you can log into that Thin Client is through Read Write. So anyone who uses the Thin Client, if your server is Vault Workgroup, would need a license of Vault Office to do so. So, you know, if you absolutely love the the way the the Thin Client you know works and you want to provide that to a lot of different users, and you have Vault Workgroup. You know, normally it makes sense from a financial standpoint to just upgrade to Vault Pro, even if the only thing you need is that thin client. But I, I could see maybe some cases where, yeah, it's still more cost effective to go with Vault Workgroup and then a few licenses of Vault Office, and then you know people could log into the to the thin client, even if it's technically they're only looking at things. You know, you could still get that that functionality with Vault Workgroup. You just have to pay for it for everybody. Um, but again, with Vault Professional, the Thin Client is free for as many users as you want. And that's actually what I find one of the most common use cases for Vault Professional is to provide access to the Vault via the Thin Client. So again, the use cases for the Thin Client, um, it's primarily would be for um, downloading single documents at a time for viewing. Um, so not like an entire inventor assembly to open up with inventor view, right? Um, or not a whole set of AutoCAD drawings necessarily. Um, you can see what files are attached. You can see uses and where used information, um, but there's no good way to download a whole set of files at once from the thin client. If your use case is, you know, I wanna download a whole tree worth of files at once for some purpose, um, you're going to want a thick client for that, Office, Workgroup, or Pro. Um, it's also important to note that the thin client does require a locally installed viewer. Uh, so, you know, it doesn't render views of documents within the browser itself. You know, the, the Autodesk, if you've ever seen the Autodesk cloud storage solutions like Fusion Team or 360, um, the cloud storage has a cloud viewing solution that renders the view of a CAD file right there in your browser, and you don't have to have anything installed, right? The thin client doesn't work that way. Um, it's very lightweight, right? But the trade-off is it doesn't render any of that stuff natively. So if your user is going to look at a file, they're going to get a copy of it somehow to their local computer, um, you know, to a temp folder usually, or they're going to download it to a downloads folder and open it up in a viewer. So that's something to keep in mind if you've got real reservations about, you know, uncontrolled digital copies of things floating around. That is something to keep in mind, that that local copies are going to end up somewhere, even if it's only temporary, uh, to be viewed. So in addition to viewing the file information, uh, property information is available as well on both items and files. So user properties, user-defined properties, system properties, um, uses and where used information, uh, attachments on uh, items. So you could look at a, a part number and then see its drawing or maybe some other documentation associated with it. Um, but you can also review bills of material um, and even print those bills out. Um, so if you do use the item master functionality um, and you need to share bonds with people or they just need to review them, um, you know, it can be a good way for someone just to quickly call up a bomb and take a look at it versus maybe firing up ERP or, or a thick client. 
Um, so again, the, the functionality in the thin client, there's basic search capability. There's advanced search where you can search on specific properties. Um, it's very similar to the types of searches you can do in the thick client. Of course, you can browse through the folder structure, um, you know, or you can, you know, browse through the item master if you'd like. And then of course, viewing, uh, viewing of documents. Now, the thin client is very lightweight. Uh, you don't have terribly many configuration options, but what you do have is, you know, typical for what most companies would need um, when they're trying to share data for non-CAD users. Um, so you can show, you can decide whether you're showing only released information or whether you're showing both released and work in progress. Um, you can show whether, decide whether you're showing just the latest version or revision of a file or an item or whether you're showing all versions. Um, you can control um, what property information is uh, visible, like by default in the grid that you're looking at. We're gonna see this in just a minute, it'll make more sense. Um, you can control whether people can only download a the visualization file, like they can only download a DWF, um, or if the DWF exists, maybe they can't download the actual file. So that that's a way if you're concerned about um, maintaining control, especially of the native CAD files. You know, you can make sure that there's always a DWF that exists of the CAD documents and then restrict downloads so that if somebody wants to look at something, they can only ever look at, you know, the DWF, which is essentially a read-only version of the file. And, you know, your, you know, your ISO procedures, um, you know, and, uh, you know, SOPs could say, yeah, a DWF is always an uncontrolled copy, for example, you know, that kind of thing to, to make auditors happy and, you know, make sure everyone understands the rules that if you're looking at a DWF, you know, you always need to, you know, be careful because it's considered an uncontrolled copy. Um, and of course you can customize the banner image that you see at the top out of the box. It's going to say Autodesk vault, but you know, you could put your company logo and name up there to make it, you know, a little more personalized. So let's take a look now at the thin client. Um, and I'm actually going to start, um, in something that very few people I think use anymore. I hope, uh, internet explorer. Um, and the reason I'm doing that is because of DWF viewing. So if you use the DWF format, um, which if you have Vault Pro or Vault Workgroup, you could use the job processor to automatically create DWFs. Um, Internet Explorer has a unique advantage in the fact that the design review plugin for browsers as far as I've been able to see, only works with Internet Explorer. It doesn't seem to work with any of the other browsers, at least not reliably and not that I've been able to actually make work. Um, so I'm gonna connect to the thin client here. Um, you know, if you've got the thin client installed, um, the URL to access it is gonna be, you know, your vault server name uh, forward slash Autodesk TC. So, you know, if you have Vault Pro and you've never seen the thin client, um, you could always try to go to this URL to see if you've got it installed. And it'll take you to this landing page where you could log in. Um, now you have to provide a username and password, um, the name of the server, of course, um, and then any vaults you might have on the system are also accessible. So this login is very similar to what you'd have in the thick client. Once logged in, you could look at, uh, you know, files through the Project Explorer. Um, you could look at items through the Item Master. Um, and you can look at, you know, previous advanced searches that you've executed. So I'm going to start, you know, we're going to take a look at files. Um, so we've got our basic search up here. We could also do an advanced find. Um, I'm going to search for uh, a file here, a drawing that I'm looking for. And much like in the thick client, when you issue a relatively, you know, uh, general basic search, you're going to get multiple results. Um, I want to take a look at this drawing. Now you'll notice as I hover over one of these files, there's a, a magnifying glass and a little disc, sort of disc looking icon. Um, the fastest way to look at one of these files, especially with Internet Explorer, if there is a DWF available, if you click this magnifying glass, it's going to open that DWF in another browser tab. 
And this is loading the design review plugin for Internet Explorer. So it actually gives you the ability to mark up um, and measure, um, really do most things that you could do to a 2D or a 3D file in design review right here, um, including save this as a local copy. So this is a great way for people who need to communicate, maybe back to engineering, uh, something about a change, you know, where they could just come up here and, you know, mark this guy up, put something in, etc., and then save this off to their own computer and then email it off to, uh, to engineering. Now there's a, a, a more controlled way of doing that with Vault Pro and the change order functionality, um, which could be enabled by Vault Office. Um, but this is awfully low cost, right? If you already own Vault, Pro, Vault Professional, um, this, there's no additional cost to do this sort of thing, right? Um, now, if you need to get the actual document, depending on the configuration of the thin client, um, you could also download the file itself, right? And this is gonna, you know, fire up a download window, or in this case, down at the bottom for Internet Explorer. Save this, so like, if you need to send a drawing to a, to a shop to get it quoted, for example, um, so someone in purchasing could access the system this way. And one thing to notice, now not all of these documents have a state associated with them, but notice I'm only really seeing released files in this folder. Um, you know, we're gonna take a look in a minute how you could configure this to show even work in progress data. Now, if you use bills of material, um, you could also, you know, review items and bombs in this interface. So I'm searching on a certain part number here. We could take a look at this guy and actually look at its bill of materials. And right now I've got this grid to configure to show even thumbnails, um, right? So this gives me kind of a little preview of what this guy looks like. Um, notice this is a multi-level bill. It's not a particularly fancy bomb, but you know you could see the, the bill of material structure all the way down the tree if you need to. If you don't wanna see some elements or if you need to see other property information about the items, um, you can always configure what properties are selected. So like if the thumbnail is just not doing me a lot of good and taking up space, you know, and I could, you know, also choose then to maybe pull out the description uh, of these guys as well. Um, and it's possible as an administrator to configure what columns are here by default, um, what properties are shown over here next to the thumbnail by default, et cetera. Right. Um, so this is just really a review of the bomb. You could also hit the print icon to get a really nicely formatted um, view of it. This is an HTML sheet. There's no way that I know of to necessarily like save this out to a PDF or anything, but if you, you know, have a virtual print driver to print to PDF, you could print this out to a PDF or you could print it out hard copy. Um, interestingly, this page does have this as like a little widget, right? So you could choose to expand uh, the bomb or not to get the right information you need on the print. Uh, now in terms of configuration, just to kind of briefly go over what and show you like the impact of um, what some of these configuration settings might do. Um, right now we're showing only released file versions. Um, so if I uncheck that, notice these changes, as soon as you make a change, this is you know pretty common these days with web applications, um, you don't have to make a bunch of option choices and then apply the changes in this case. As soon as you check this box, the change is made, right? So now if I come back here and we, we go back and look at our, uh, the folder that had that that carburetor in it. Notice we're seeing um, both released and work in progress data. And if I look at one of these files that's had a lot of changes to it, you know, we're seeing um, a lot of prior versions, but interestingly what we're seeing is we're seeing the released revisions, uh, the released versions of prior files, but we're also able to see work in progress information um, for what is a, now what appears to be a pending revision, right? So depending on what your users need access to, like if you want them to be able to see the fact that there is work in progress data going on, um, and so maybe they should hold off on requesting a quote to have this made until they, you know, you know, talk to engineering about it. You know, you could choose to show this work in progress data. Otherwise, if your use case is that people should never see um, 
work in progress data and maybe they should never see historical data even. You know, you could say show me only the latest version always. And in that case now what we're seeing is just the latest released revision. So there's Rev E in our vault as work in progress. We're working on that in engineering, but as far as the rest of the company is concerned, Rev D is the current thing. And if they have any questions about it, you know, you know, they can always contact engineering, but right now they should just keep building Rev D. Right. So you have a fair amount of control um, over, you know, what can be seen in this interface. Um, again, it's not, um, it's really lightweight, but it, it doesn't need to be particularly heavy um, because it's effective. Right. Now, if that doesn't quite meet your needs, or especially if you're using Vault Basic or if you're using Vault Workgroup and you've got, you know, just a ton of Vault Workgroup users and it doesn't make financial sense to upgrade to Vault Professional, you know, just to get access to drawings via a browser, um, there are other solutions, one of which is Hagerman's QVP connection. Um, and QVP stands for Query, View, and Print. So this, again, it's, a, it's an application that we sell. You know, you buy uh, a certain number of licenses based on the number of users you have. Um, and it functions very similarly to the thin client. It just have some, has some important distinctions. Um, it still allows for searching for files and, you know, download of those files for viewing. Um, it still uses a locally installed viewer. Um, but there are some key differences, um, one of which it works with all versions of Vault, including Vault Basic. Um, it could be less expensive than upgrading to Vault Pro, um, but one of the most important functional differences is you can pre-configure searches. So when we looked at the thin client just a moment ago, um, I just did a basic search, right? And that could return lots of results and they wouldn't be particularly targeted. Now you can do an advanced search in the thin client, the vault thin client, right? So let's say I wanted to search on uh, a certain product, a property called product line. Well, A, I have to know that that product line property exists. Um, I have to look through the entire list of all available properties, right? And if you index a lot of properties, this may be a pretty long list. Um, I've got to find the product line property. I have to adjust, you know, the method of search that I want, which is nice because it's configurable, you know, on demand. Um, but, you know, I've got to know what to type into this box and I've got to know it every time. And in fact, this actually didn't return any results just because of the way, you know, searching in, in Vault works. Um, I really need to include uh, an asterisk in there, right? So if I do that, then I'll get some results. Oh, I've got to make sure I'm saying to search files here. Well, I should have gotten some results. Let me just do that one more time. We're searching files. Product line contains hydro. Uh, wow, that's not even coming back with anything. Okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, if you're relying on users, especially users that aren't particularly um, uh, savvy, um, when using, you know, interfaces like this, you know, it might be a struggle for them to, to search that way every time, or if there's a few different properties they ever search on, um, you know, that might be a, a, a bit of a struggle. Um, now, what QVP can do is um, it can have um, pre-configured searches. So I want to search on product line, and, or I want to search for, um, only released documents, or I want to search only for PDFs, right? And notice as I do that, the criteria here for the search are actually changing, right? So I'm presented only with the things that um, an administrator has thought I need to be able to search on, right? And an administrator can configure what types of searches are there, um, how these boxes are searched, is it a contains, is it an equals, um, et cetera, um, and what's on the list. And if I type in here, now I'm getting some results, right? So I could grab one of these guys. Um, I could download the file. 
and view it with a locally installed viewer, um, right? And I think this works particularly well um, if you use PDFs because browsers, um, at least you know Chrome and Firefox, and I think Edge as well, even Internet Explorer, I believe, um, can natively render PDFs. Well, Internet Explorer uses the, the Adobe Reader plugin, um, but like Chrome um, can natively render a PDF right inside the browser. Um, so for viewing a PDF like so, um, you know, I could download it, click to open, and then look at the drawing straight away right inside the browser. So it's, you know, one more click than using like the DWF format and the thin client. But that one more click means you can use Chrome or Firefox, which are just more secure browsers in general, um, and you could use the PDF format, right? So there are a lot of pros to that. Um, in addition to um, being able to have these very targeted searches. So, you know, you could actually control it to where um, maybe certain searches show only release data, and maybe that's you know, the default search, or maybe other searches should be allowed to show work in progress data. Um, and you can also control who has access to what searches, like on a user level. Um, so you've got a lot more control. It's, it, this QVP really is almost like setting up like a viewing kiosk um, for users, um, because you can control very carefully what their experience happens to be versus you know a more open experience with something like the thin client. So I think there are a lot of potential advantages to QVP. And if you've got some interest in it, you know, just um, contact your Hagerman account manager and you know we can set up a demonstration or something. Um, also on the Hagerman website, um, we've got a link to our uh, connection softwares, um, QVP connection here. It's got some more information about it, uh, a brochure. Um, and you can always request more information about it, and we'll, you know, get in touch with you. All right, so um, that covers at least the most common ways people might interact with Vault in a read-only manner. But what about read-write access, right? What about people who don't use CAD, um, but they need to um, modify data in Vault in some way? Right? Maybe you manage PDFs or non-CAD files uh, in your vault, and people need to you know, have input and modify those documents, like uh, um, technical publications or you know, contract managers, and you store contract in the vaults or um, things like that. Well, that's where Vault Office can come into play. So if you've never heard of Vault Office, it's, a, it's licensed. Um, uh, just like a workgroup or pro client, um, and there's one question that came into QVP about QVP I want to answer before we go on. Um, can QVP also interface with ECM, like enterprise content managers? Um, I believe so, yes. So off the shelf, um, it may not interact with your specific ECM. However, um, we um, absolutely have the ability, you know, it's our product, so we have the ability to um, customize it, you know, and the way it's designed, it's designed to be fairly easily customi customizable by, by us to release a custom distribution for you um, that can essentially look into just about any database, um, interact with it, return search results, and, you know, potentially download files. Um, so it can be a great way, QVP can also be a great way to bridge multiple systems, because um, if people need to search in one, two, three different systems, you know, you could create connections to all those different systems um, and essentially unify the search experience or at least the search UI. So uh, thank you for the question. Um, now back to Vault Office, where it fits in things, um, it fits, it works both with work group and professional, right? Um, with Vault Office, you can look at any file in the Vault. You could get a copy of any file from the Vault. Um, and that mechanism works just like the, the other Vault clients. So if you need to download an entire Inventor assembly, you could do that with Vault Office. Say, give me the assembly and all the children and they'll come out. Um, you can make changes to non-CAD files, right? So you could check out a non-CAD document. You could add, you know, or check in non-CAD documents. You don't even have that option for CAD files, which we'll see. Um, you can also view items and bills of material. You cannot create 
new items. You cannot edit item information or I edit bombs, but you can look at items and bombs. Now you can also participate in the change order process fully um, because you can change the state of items um, and change the state of files. So if you need to even be like a change administrator, um, as long as it's, you know, you're not changing CAD documents or modifying item data, you could still change uh, states of those things. So you could pretty fully participate in the change, the in the vault change order process. And then, um, of course, there's a thick client and the thin client, um, you know, the thin client comes with pro and read only, but Vault Office gives you read write through the thin client. And then Vault Office has its own thick client as well. Um, so um, it, it can do most of what Workgroup and Pro can do. Um, it's really best suited for environments that have just a few viewers, um, but lots of CAD users, um, or, or, or where you've got um, non-CAD data that's managed by Vault, um, because it's, it's lower cost than either work group or professional, right? That's really the trick here is there's, you know, there's significant restrictions on functionality, but um, the trade-off is it's significantly less expensive, um, especially when compared to like a floating Vault professional license versus a floating Vault office license. Um, don't quote me on this, but I think the cost is roughly about a quarter. Uh, for Vault Office, so it's significantly less expensive. Um, so, and you know, remember that you can get access to the thin client in Vault, Vault Workgroup by using Vault Office, but it's important to remember it does not provide free viewing. So it's not like you could buy one license of Vault Office and have a hundred free viewers in Vault Workgroup. It doesn't work that way, right? Um, so when you're logging into the thin client. Um, that's connecting to a Vault Workgroup installation, um, it's always going to require a license of Vault Office no matter what you're doing with it. So because um, there are restrictions, I mean, the way I look at Vault Office is it's important to understand the restrictions for Vault Office um, because, you know, obviously you're going to want to go with the, the license mix that is the least cost to you. But it's important to, to know that if you give uh, Vault Office to a user that they're going to be able to do their job, right? So that's why I'm going to go through what I find out at least all the most important restrictions, if not all of the restrictions of Vault Office. So if you're thinking of maybe switching some users you have over to Vault Office um, or deploying Vault to some people and if Vault Office seems like a good fit, it's important to know uh, what it can't do to make sure it's going to work for them. So it cannot check out or check in CAD files. Right, this is like an IDW, a DWG, an IAM, IPTs, etc. Um, however, you can attach non-CAD files to CAD files. So if you know someone's again like technical uh, publications or um, you know safety sheets or work instructions or assembly instructions, someone's responsible for working with those, and that's all they do. They never need to edit the CAD data, maybe they need to look at the CAD data and take screen captures or something, Vault Office could work for them because they could get a copy of an inventor assembly, look at it in inventor view if they needed to, or, you know, a DWF in, in design review, create their documents, check those documents into Vault via Vault Office, and then maybe attach the assembly instructions to the assembly model, and they would still be able to do that, right? Um, and I have verified all of these personally with a Vault Office client. That's the only reason I'm comfortable talking about what it can't do. Um, and if you have any questions about a specific workflow and whether Vault Office would fit, um, feel free to you know type it in as a question, um, or you know again contact your Hagerman account manager and you know we can have a a, a specific discussion about your needs. Um, some other things it cannot do. Again, it's important to know what it can't do. Um, it cannot categorize, like change category, change lifecycle definition, or change the revision of CAD files, right? It can change CAD file state, and that's important, you know, if you're potentially important if you're working with change orders in Vault, um, but it really can't do anything else to the lifecycle behavior or revision behavior of a CAD document. Um, it can do all of that stuff for non-CAD files, but again, you cannot change category, lifecycle definition, or revision of a CAD document. Um, it also cannot create or modify 
items. Um, you can look at the item details. You can look at the bomb. Um, and again, you can change the item state, again, because that's important for change order behavior. But you cannot modify the item in any other way. Um, can participate in change orders, right? Um, cannot update CAD file previews natively, like on the machine, right? So you can't, if you if you use the DWF format and you use it for markups um, in a change order, um, a, a Vault Office user would not be able to um, update the DWF um, of a file um, on their workstation. They would have to queue that update um, and have that sent to a job processor somewhere you're in your environment that was running the full uh, Vault client, either Workgroup or Pro. Um, the job processor also doesn't come with Vault Office. So you could not install Vault Office on a computer and use that as your job processor to you know, update CAD properties and all that, right? So um, Vault Office can participate in the change process. It could even do markups, um, but um, it could not <clears throat> it could not generate the DWF instantly um, if it didn't already exist. And probably the most important restriction of them all, you cannot install Vault Office on the same computer that has Vault Workgroup or Pro installed, um, at least of the same release. So I've got a the, the workstation I'm going to be using Vault Office on. It's got prior releases of like Vault Pro like 2017 or something installed. Um, I was able to install Vault Office 2019 on that computer, but I would not be able to install Vault Pro 2019. Actually, in fact, I had to uninstall Vault Pro 2019 from that computer to put Office on it. So you do not have the case where you could put both of them on someone's computer and then sometimes they could use the Vault Pro license to do a CAD thing and then the rest of the time they use Vault Office to do the rest of the work. Um, you can't do that. You really have to decide, is this person a Vault Office user or a workgroup slash pro user. Um, so let's take a look. Um, well, really quickly, just about the thin client, just to you confirm this. Again, notice that read-only access checkbox down there. Um, Office does impact the thin client, which we'll see here in just a second. Um, you get the ability to add a file to the vault through the thin client. You get the ability to check out files through the thin client. Right, so that means you can actually modify Vault data, non-CAD data, um, through the thin client, which can be you know pretty effective, right? Because you don't have to install a, a client of any sort on that computer, but a user could still you know modify a document, which is pretty nice. So let's take a look at Vault Office now. So I'm going to launch the Vault Office client. You'll notice it looks an awful lot like Workgroup and Pro. exact same login screen. And really everything does look the same. Um, the difference is if you go and hunt down a CAD file, you'll notice a lot of these buttons are not available. I can't change category. I can't change revision. On the context menu, you just simply can't do them, which is nice because that prevents like a user seeing, you know, check out, um, and then getting a message saying, no, you can't do that, right? So it's here because they may need to be able to check out or check in a non-CAD document. That's why it's on the list. But for anything they can't touch, they just don't have the option to do it. Similarly with items, you know, I can look at an item. Um, there's no new item button. I can't press the edit button on an item, you know, but at least I can look at the details. I can look at a bill of materials, et cetera. Right. Um, but you can, you know, change the state of files. So this CAD file here, it's a work in progress. If I'm someone who's reviewing things and I review this document, I think it looks good. If part of the workflow is to, you know, indicate my approval by, you know, putting it into a review state, I could still do that with Vault Office. I can do that, right? So um, Vault Office does still enable some, you know, the file lifecycle or item lifecycle based workflows. You just can't modify the underlying document or item itself. Right. Now, in terms of the thin client, so I'm logged in right now um, with right access. So you'll notice the add file button is here. So I could browse, add a file to this folder. 
um, I can still search. So um, I'm going to show you something else in a minute with the vault data standard. Um, but I've got uh, like an ECO process here in my vault um, that I'm using like a completely file-based ECO process. You know, I could check this file out and get a copy of it. Open that guy up, make some modifications, right? Like make a change to something here, save it. And then check that guy in and update the version of the file, right? Um, so it's not quite as smooth as the thick client, right? Because if I check out a file here, I'm going to have the file status. I could check it right back in from this interface, et cetera. Um, with the browser, you always, if you're going to check in a version of the file, you always have to, you know, browse to that file, um, right? If the file name doesn't match, you know, that's not going to work. And so depending on how you're working, you know, there's a workflow involved because as I download into the same folder, right, it's, you know, downloading it with a different name, right? So it, it might be incumbent upon the user to keep their workspace clean, stuff like that. Um, but it's possible, right? And it can enable some workflows. Um, I don't know terribly many uh, companies that are doing this, but it may be largely because a lot of people don't know you can do this, right? But it's it's a nice functionality. Uh, so we're getting close to the to the top of the hour here. Um, I want to move on to the next topic, uh, the Vault Data Standard. Um, this is something that comes with Vault Professional um, and Vault Workgroup. I think maybe a lot of people don't know that it exists. Um, right, um, it's an add-in. Um, there are add-ins for Inventor, for the Vault client, and for AutoCAD. Um, and it's, I think its primary purpose is really to enforce data integrity, um, right? So um, if you're using it with Inventor, if you're using it with AutoCAD, and it's enabled, um, every time you try to save a document for the first time in one of those applications, um, you get a dialog pops up that looks like this guy here. Um, and it's going to ask you to fill out some properties. It gives you the ability to maybe choose a category for the document, um, even choose a, a place in the vault where that file should go, right? So you're not worrying about where on your local workspace do you save that file. You're actually picking a vault location for that file right from the get-go. Um, so the data standard can be pretty nice. Um, it can also be a little bit, um, you know, heavy, right, depending on your environment. Um, I find it's especially useful for companies that maybe have transitioned from older or different document management systems that are a bit more heavy-handed when they collect property information about files and people are used to filling out a form of information, you know, as they add a document to the system. Vault data standard, you know, provides that capability. Um, but another thing that it does um, is it allows you to create documents right, um, right in the vault from the vault client um, from templates that are also stored in the vault, um, which is great for non-CAD users. Um, you know, if you've got, you know, assembly instructions where there's a certain, like, word template you want to use or certain spreadsheets with templates you want to use. Um, you can put those in the vault. You can, you know, install the data standard and then create those new files from a template. And they start their life in the vault with the right category, maybe the right starting information, et cetera, in the right place. Um, and what's interesting about the data standards, you can also configure the vault UI to some degree. Um, you know, if you want to create a new type of document specifically, which we're going to see here in a second, um, you can customize a context menu to go straight to creating that document type. Um, so again, the impact on non-CAD users that the data standard would have, um, you can create documents directly from templates that includes categories and numbering schemes. Um, I want to show you a, a, what I think would be a fairly common workflow for something like this, um, which would be a file-based ECO process. So Vault Pro has change order functionality, right? It's got a change order record. It's got great a great way to, you know, collect information um, from people. It's got the routing lists 
Um, one thing it doesn't let you do is configure the workflow, right? You can configure who has responsibility, but not the flow itself. So that can be a, 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 a non-starter for some companies where they've got, you know, a workflow where maybe they have a, a linear multi-step approval process. Um, it may not fit this mold. Um, so what you can do in vaults and what, you know, other document management systems do that only manage files is that, but also have life cycle is they may have, you know, a document based ECO process where a document is sort of the record controlling things. And it often, you know, looks like, um, you know, uh, an ECO sheet that you might print out in hard copy. It's just digital, right? Um, and then you might attach to that ECO some CAD files, and then that ECO might undergo, you know, um, a workflow just like any file, but it's more like open, review, work state, you know, we've closed it up, et cetera. Um, and Vault Data Standard could really enable a workflow like this because I could, you know, customize um, a menu choice here. I want to make a new ECO, and this is going to fire up a data standard dialogue with a category pre-selected for me, um, the type of document pre-selected and even a template that's stored in my vault. It's gonna pick the numbering scheme for me automatically. So it's essentially gonna give me a new ECO number. And then I can fill out the, the, the metadata for this ECO. Um, um, and even to the point where there are certain properties that are required, like you have to pick a due date. Um, you know, a date type property. So, and this is all, this, what we're looking at here isn't 100% out of the box functionality because I've, you know, customized the context menu and I've um, made it so that when I pick that new ECO command, all of this stuff is pre-selected. But it's really pretty straightforward if you know what you're doing to enable this kind of behavior. I mean, it takes, really um, minutes to hours, not days, where traditionally, if you were trying to do this via a custom add-in, it would definitely take days to try to create this kind of behavior, right? But I create my ECO, it automatically categorizes it, um, gives it its number, um, it's in a particular state, um, and at that point, I could check it out, make changes to the ECO, I could attach things to it, et cetera, right? So this is just like one example of what the uh, the data standard could do for a non-CAD workflow, right? Um, but I can create, you know, any type of file. Um, you know, I have access to, you know, all these different categories in my vault. Notice that this window dynamically changes the properties here, and this is based on your vault configuration. So you don't have to configure what properties are here. This is related to what properties are associated with this specific document category. Um, you know, I could have different template types, inventor templates, AutoCAD templates. Um, I have, I created my own type of template for ECOs, for example, all the different numbering schemes you have available, um, right? So this can really, again, enable non-CAD workflows in the vault, creating documents completely from scratch within the system so that they're, they never start outside and fail to get in the system, right? That's, that's really important. So there's one last topic I want to discuss. We don't have a lot of time left, but I just want to kind of, I, I, I think this is interesting. So I wanted to end on this interesting note. Um, and it's, you know, talking about the item master because a lot of people don't use the item master. I think they, a lot of, you know, companies already have well-established means of manipulating their bombs and, you know, Vault Pro doesn't necessarily always have a good fit there, but, um, you don't necessarily have to think of items um, just as things to do bills of material, right? So their purpose is for bombs, right? Um, you know, you extract, you know, items from an inventor assembly, uh, an ACAD-E file, an ACAD-M file, um, manipulate that bill of materials inside the vault so you don't have to do it in Excel or, or a, a, a painful ERP system. And the idea really is to, to to polish that bill of materials before you send it downstream to production, purchasing, et cetera, right? But um, when I talk about non-traditional, um, I'm talking about really thinking about what items, how they actually function in the vault and how that functionality might be applied 
to other situations, right? So an item is an independent record in Vault. It's its own record. Um, it can undergo life cycle and revision, just like a file, but it's not a file. Um, they carry their own independent properties that could be linked to file properties, but don't have to be, right? These items may or may not be linked to documents. The fact that they can be linked to documents is very powerful, um, right? But they don't have to be linked to documents. Um, so that alone is kind of nice. And um, yeah, they're in Vault Pro, there's something called custom objects, which could sort of stand in for that. But custom objects are really designed for add-ins to use for, for storing data. Um, where, where I think items become very interesting is the fact that these items can be linked hierarchically, right? You've got, you can have a parent-child relationships and multi-level relationships between the items, whatever an item represents. Um, they're also visible in the thin client, right? So if you need to display hierarchies of information to people and each of those, you know, members of the hierarchy have information about them, um, you could display that information through the thin client. And this information can also be exported, right? So if you've got information that you can quantify in distinct bits, those bits carry information, they're linked together in a hierarchy, you might be able to use the item master functionality to represent that information. Now, if that's all you need to do, Vault Pro is probably not the solution for that because lots of systems can do that, right? But if you're already using Vault to manage your file data, but you don't have any need for bombs, but you've got other information that you need to manage and link together, you know, there might be some benefit there, right? And um, I wanna show you just a real quick example of that. We're running really short on time, um, but um, it's something, you know, I, a proof of concept I did for uh, another customer, um, and it has to do with uh, drawing lists. So, um, they're a vehicle manufacturer. Um, they um, shut my browser down here and try this again. They produce different model numbers. There are a lot of common components um, among all of those um, model numbers. And their service department needs um, to be able to quickly find uh, a set of drawings, maybe even for a particular VIN, right, that they've produced. Um, a particular vehicle that they've produced. So, you know, this example here, um, I've got a big list of VIN numbers. You know, it's not a big list, but ultimately it would be. And so, you know, someone in the service department could search for a VIN, and when they find that VIN, you know, they could look at the quote unquote bill of materials to see all of the drawings um, that are associated with that VIN. So yes, this information has to come from somewhere, like engineering has to somehow put it together, but you know, there are ways you could make that you know, um, relatively easy to do as well. But then the service department, you know, there could be descriptions on all these guys for what they actually are. Um, I don't recall if those are in my vault, but we'll take a quick look and see. Right, so this could be like uh, you know, front end um, you know, housing or something like that. And then I could look at the drawing and so just like that, I was able to get to the drawing. So even though this isn't necessarily a bill of materials relationship, it's not some assembly we're producing, um, it's still a hierarchy of information, in this case, drawing numbers, um, that makes it easy for someone to find that information and act on it, right? So just an example, something to keep in mind. Again, um, there are other systems that can do that, but if, if you're already using Vault Pro, it can just improve the return on your, your existing investment, right? So um, with that, um, we've reached to the top of the hour. Um, I'll open it up for other questions. There is one other question I see here. Um, for an environment where all documents have to be controlled, what is the recommended solution for read-only users? Um, so if all of your documents have to be controlled and they're being controlled by Vault, um, the, the thin client is probably gonna be uh, your best bet in Vault Pro. Um, it really comes down to um, the number of users you have viewing versus the number of people you have editing um, and um, the way in which those not read-only users need to find things. So the thin client is great because it's free with Vault Professional. 
So if you have a hundred people that need to look at stuff, um, that's probably almost always going to be the most cost effective unless you have a hundred CAD users as well. But the ratio is usually not one to one um, in an environment where everything is controlled. So in that case, thin client may be the best, most fi best financial sense. Um, if your ratio of CAD users to read only users is closer to one to one or two to one, you know, um, you know, vault office may be a good fit. Um, QVP from, from Hagerman and company can be a good fit where you've got a lot of read only users that are not great with computers because you can very carefully curate their search process. Um, you know, but it really kind of depends. And so if you've got, um, specific questions, um, Oh, I see. So a follow up to that. Unfortunately, the thin client is, is downloads the files and the files become uncontrolled. That is the downside of really any solution with Vault is I don't know of any solution, first or third party, um, that renders the view um, without downloading the file to the local computer. Um, that's a really, really good question. Now, Autodesk has that technology in their cloud solution, right? But it's not available on premise. Um, so I think what I would do is I would go to the Autodesk Vault idea station um, so if you Google that, um, and if an idea for that already doesn't exist, um, I would create an idea saying, give us the ability to render documents in the thin client. Autodesk has the technology, right? <laughs> um, it's just a matter of whether or not it's cost effective and beneficial for them um, to, uh, to maybe include it or at least make it as something you could purchase for on-premise use. Um, so that's that's what I would do. Um, otherwise, the only other way I can think of is if you used like terminal services to connect to a computer that, uh, that enabled the thin client. And so all those documents went to that computer that other other users couldn't otherwise get to. Um, but that that just causes its own trouble. So any other questions about uh, Vault for non-CAD users? Um, there was one other question. Um, will I be doing additional Vault seminars? Uh, Hagerman and company absolutely will be. I'm sure I'll be doing some of those in the pa in the future as well. Um, I can't think off the top of my head any that I've got coming up about Vault, um, but I'm sure sometime in the probably May, June timeframe, um, either myself or someone else will be doing a webcast about what's new in Vault 2020. Um, and I'm sure we'll have at least another two or three webcasts throughout 2019 on various Vault topics as well. I haven't seen any other questions come in, so I think um, with that, we'll wrap it up. Okay, well, thanks, Forrest. Um, this will conclude our broadcast. If you think of additional questions later, you can simply reply to the confirmation or reminder email you received from GoToWebinar. We can get those to Forrest or your sales rep to get your an questions answered. Uh, once again, if you could fill out the survey, it will just pop up as we close down today. And thanks for attending the webcast, everyone. Have a great day.